realized 10 minutes before we started that uh, I hadn't really organized the paper down into a stop flow presentation as I normally do. So I've kind of scrolled some notes here and I might be clicking back and forward a bit, but hopefully it'll hang together uh, as, as intended. Um, what I want to talk about is based on the title, obviously, why humanitarianism, why humanitarianism needs a pacifist ethos. Um, and this really comes out of thinking about um, the traditions of humanitarian action in international politics, uh, particularly the commitment by humanitarian organizations, firstly with the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross and then later organizations, I'll mention them a couple in, in a moment, um, the commitment to neutrality and impartiality in their action, which signals uh, a detachment from politics based on the idea that if we these organizations engage in politics by taking sides with a particular state or by refusing to treat certain people because they're considered to be an enemy, um, then you lose humanity. You lose the humanitarian dimension of, of the very um, idea itself. So I guess I depart from the point uh, by saying that theoretically and I think practically, humanitarianism was born out of uh, an, an anti-political or an apolitical position which necessarily points towards pacifism because it doesn't allow for the destruction of a particular enemy to achieve a particular objective. It's not about dividing people, it's about thinking universally and acting universally in a consistent way. Uh, but this has been lost, this sense of humanitarianism, uh, that very uh, consistent and coherent sense of the universalism of humanitarianism and its detachment uh, from, from politics has, has been lost in really significant ways, particularly since the end of the Cold War. So there are two um, questions that I want to look at in relation to this. The first is why are the principles of impartiality and neutrality important to humanitarian ethics and action, and how have they been sidelined over recent decades? And the second, in what ways might a renewed emphasis on a pacifist ethos be of benefit to the future prospects of humanitarianism in both theory and practice. So I start firstly with uh, the debate over the status of neutrality and impartiality in humanitarian action. And you know, I've already mentioned the ICRC, where you have uh, in their principles these very strong commitments to impartiality and neutrality, precisely on the, on the grounds that I've already outlined, that, that we must be uh, impartial terms of who we offer assistance to in, in conflict situations, to all people who are suffering regardless of, of their status, uh, regardless of their political commitments and allegiances and so on. Um, and that we should not engage in the political contests that may have led to the war or be a part of the, the war situation. Uh, the detachment from that is important to retain, the, for the practical reason of retaining access to the field, retaining access to those people who are suffering. So the more we engage politically, the more we uh, lose sight of impartiality, the less we can commit to our humanitarian values. It's a very strongly held view within the ICRC um, up to the present. You can also see this in a number of other humanitarian organisations, including uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. Um, they have the same principles of impartiality and neutrality in their, uh, in their core values. Uh, it's somewhat offset by the principle of I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, témoignage or, or witnessing, um, where, which allows for the idea of, um, you know, of bearing witness and of, in some sense engaging in a political situation by revealing what's happening uh, to the world in order to encourage more humanitarian action by other actors. But it was a debate over that principle within MSF which actually led to a split in the organisation. Uh, where you have Bernard Kuchner, who was one of the, one of the leaders of MSF, who, who felt that that uh, the principles of impartiality and neutrality were, were being observed too, too rigidly, and that there was a need for more emphasis on the witnessing, more emphasis on encouraging political engagement with crisis situations, and for that reason he left MSF and formed another organisation. So it's a, it's, a big, it's a big issue, it's a big debate within the humanitarian community, it always has been and it continues to be up to the present. There was an attempt to overcome some of this by developing um, a set of principles for a wide, a wide range of humanitarian organisations that they could all subscribe to. These were called the core principles. Um, the, I, it was 2014, 2015. Um, and 
in those principles as well, you can see uh, some of the issues here, uh, some of the tensions between the different organisations. Because again, you have uh, the principles of humanity, impartiality, and independence and neutrality. These are seen as essential to humanitarian work. Uh, but there's, a, there's also a bit of a disclaimer. It says some organisations, while committed to giving impartial assistance and not taking sides in hostilities, do not consider that the principle of neutrality precludes undertaking advocacy on issues related to accountability and justice. These debates really uh, intensified and came to a head in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, as a consequence of the, uh, the intense focus on humanitarian intervention post-Cold War, uh, really beginning with the intervention in Somalia in the early 1990s, uh, the perceived failures in Rwanda in 1994, and then uh, what many people at the time considered to be a success in terms of thinking about humanitarian intervention uh, in, in Kosovo in 1999. But it prompted a lot of, uh, a lot of questioning about where this left um, those principles of, humani of humanitarian neutrality and impartiality. Uh, if states were now deploying the language of humanitarianism in order to justify military power. So the, the problem here was the, was the sense that in engaging with uh, the human rights discourse of the 1990s, this untrammeled optimism and utopianism that, that gripped international po politics, international political thinkers, and which guided a lot of international political action over that time, uh, that humanitarianism had kind of slipped into the political, and by slipping into the political had uh, become... Um, not only politicized, but instrumentalized, militarized, uh, weaponized uh, by the end of the 1990s. Uh, to the extent that I think most people in the public would associate humanitarian action with military action. That if, that if you had a conversation with people, that would be the sort of first thing they would think of is what is a humanitarian act? It's intervening to save people using military force. And I think that that's uh, largely the case still today. So this is um, an issue, and as I've said, around from, from Kosovo uh, and then into the war on terror, terror period, the invasion of Afghanistan and the subsequent invasion of Iraq, these concerns intensified, and a number, number of people started writing um, about, about this problem of where humanitarianism had, had ended up at this time. Uh, in Afghanistan in particular, a number of organisations were distressed to find that their, their actions were being dictated by uh, the United States in particular and other military powers who were operating in Afghanistan. And there was this emergent talk of, of the need for a coherent system between <coughs> the state, military power, and, and those humanitarian organizations. And this, I think, started to raise more and more tension and concern amongst these groups as to, as to what to do. So. Uh, what we saw by around that time was that the, the claim or the argument we must do something in relation to crisis situations that we were observing, whether it be in uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia or, or Rwanda or elsewhere, Afghanistan. Uh, so that we must do something argument, I think it's very much associated with the figure of Tony Blair, it certainly is for me, uh, had led to the militarization of humanitarianism and in two particular ways. Firstly, in relation to international humanitarian law, uh, the Geneva Conventions, um, and a number of international law lawyers, criti critical international legal scholars, um, like uh, David Kennedy is a prominent example, argued, and he, he was writing about this in 2003, 2004, so in that war on terror context, that uh, what we'd seen was this pure instrumentalization of international humanitarian law by states, which is now um, sort of turned into what people routinely refer to as lawfare, uh, where humanitarian law becomes integral to how states justify their military action. So that <laughs> militarization, the purposes of international humanitarian law, which is to restrain uh, the conduct of law, have in fact led to a point where it's been used to legitimize action rather than to restrain it. The other element is the broader, uh, you know, less legal, more generic question around humanitarian intervention, the use of force for human protection purposes or for saving strangers, however we want to characterize it. And this was based less on international humanitarian law and more on just war theory. 
Um, so again, drawing on uh, moral principles which were perhaps intended to constrain the waging of war, but what we start to see is a kind of blossoming of the use of these terms by states um, wanting to associate themselves with humanitarian law and humanitarian values and just laws in order to uh, fulfill their interests in whatever way they saw fit. So humanitarianism is really lost in this context. Um, and two, two particular writers on this, I think, quite, make quite powerful statements, David Chandler and uh, David Reef. David's writing about this stuff for some reason. Um, so Chandler, for example, said, humanitarian action has become transformed from relying on empathy with suffering victims and providing emergency aid to mobilizing misanthropy and legitimizing the politics of international condemnation, sanctions, bombing. Uh, within the humanitarian organizations themselves, again, it was MSF that started to express a lot of discomfort with what was happening. Uh, there were a number of reports that they issued in 2003, 2005, um, in the context of what was happening in, in Afghanistan and then Iraq, about how they felt they were being pressured into operating within a humanitarian coherent system, an integrated system with states. And so there's a renewed emphasis on the need for impartiality that the idea that it's vital to continue uh, providing medical assistance to vulnerable, vulnerable populations in need. But David Reef, in his book, um, A Bed for the Night, Humanitarianism in Crisis, published in 2002, he saw this as a consequence um, <coughs> of hubris on the part of humanitarian organizations, the belief that, uh, that they would now responsible for and that they should engage in politics to the extent that uh, it's about addressing root causes by bringing about democratization, bringing development to societies, um, and you know, participating in the politics around that, that they could really transform the world in a, in a more fundamental way, rather than just treating the symptoms of war. So it's not, it's not just about responding to people suffering as a consequence of war, it's about trying to stop those wars from ever occurring again. So for Reef, it's the utopianism of, of the human rights movement collapsed into uh, the humanitarian movement, uh, alongside the military power of the states. Uh, and this leads to what he, he describes as the loss of the specific moral gravity of the traditions of humanitarianism. A specific moral gravity that is fundamentally anchored in their traditions of impartiality and neutrality. So that, the argument that Reef makes is that that was always the value of humanitarianism. That in some sense it was always grounded in failure and that the best humanitarian organizations and, and actors recognized that, that what the work that they did was about addressing the failings of humanity rather than believing that they could do away with those failings uh, once and for all. So it's in this context, uh, you know, that you can say, well, it's no surprise uh, that the purposes, <laughs> that the loss of impartiality and neutrality, which were so central to the establishment of humanitarianism, um, would lead to a fragmentation of, of thinking about what the, what the purpose and what the, what the moral gravity of humanitarian action actually was. Um, so the argument here is that you need to, there's a need for return to neutrality and impartiality and more, more particularly that that must be through adherence to um, a consistent pacifist ethos. That neutrality and impartiality will continue to be uh, questioned will continue to be a problem for these organizations so long as they are comfortable with uh, working alongside the state and so long as the, the sort of public imagination around humanitarianism is so wedded to the use of military force in order to rescue people who are suffering. So again, I think this is um, evident if, you, if we look at the history of the, of the ICRC, for example, and Henri Dunant, um, a lot of what they said in establishing that organization was that they hoped that it would, that by example, that it would lead to the elimination of warfare, that the humanitarian act of giving aid to people was, um, was guided by a horizon of pacifist uh, possibilities. They were not supportive of the use of force under any circumstances for political purposes. I think, though, that there's, a, you know, there was a lot of Christian values in, in that, in the, in the liberal international lawyers who, who fed into the establishment of the ICRC, there was a lot of uh, attachment to Christian, to Christian values and principles. Um, what I would argue for is the need for a different kind of pacifism that's perhaps less absolute, 
uh, perhaps less grounded in, in theology uh, and that espouses pacifist values as a practical orientation, as an attitude rather than as uh, a solution to the world's problems. So a pacifist ethos doesn't point us towards an expectation of universal peace. Um, it comes back to some extent to Niburian thinking, it might be related to some of the things that Caleb was talking about yesterday. You know, a recognition that you know, we, we aspire to these things, but uh, alongside that, a recognition that we are unlikely to ever fully achieve them. So this, um, again, returns to Reef's critique of humanitarianism because um, one of his ideas was that what was lost in humanitarianism in the 1990s with this emergence of the humanitarian interventionist ideology was a sense of limit and a sense of the tragic, a sense of the... Um, the fact that humanitarianism is born out of failure itself, the failure of humans to, to behave, to be good, to not destroy each other. So this is described by uh, one, one of the reviewers of Reef's work who, uh, from the humanitarian community himself, who, who describes it as an, an ethic of humanitarian resistance, um, that a return to an understanding of humanitarianism as guided by nonviolence, uh, as guided by impartiality and neutrality, can, can amount to a resistance to power and to war. This is not an apolitical humanitarianism. Uh, it is a politics of setting an example that is contrary to the actions of violent states. Uh, and I think it's, it's hugely important um, because what we've seen is that humanitarianism has largely become a figure for uh, making war more palatable. Um, it is operated far too much in the service of, of state interests and the inter interests of, of a military industrial complex. Um, I think you can see the debates around killer robots now are very much guided by questions over what's going to be, is this going to be more humanitarian war or less humanitarian war? Uh, just war thinking has fed into this, into this as well. And I think humanitarianism really needs to take a step back for that and cannot be about making war more palatable. It has to be about consistent opposition to war whilst treating the symptoms and treating the suffering that is caused by warfare. And I think, as I've said, um, you know, Kimberly Hutchings has written about this as, as a dirty pacifism. I think some of the things that Molly was talking about yesterday in relation to wrestling with the others, I think that this is the kind of politics that humanitarianism can represent without that slippage into just warism and into militarization, instrumentalization, and weaponization. Uh, so I'll leave it.